Great, thank you. I'm delighted to be here. So I'm hoping to provide you with an overview of our research and why the title, Women Are Creating the Glass Ceiling and Have the Power to End It. I want to start with going back to 1979. That was the year that Madonna, Prince, Ellen, and yours truly turned 21 years old. And actually, it was a very big year. Not only did I turn 21, that's when I started my HR career, but even more important, that's when the Pregnancy Act, the US Pregnancy Act went into effect. And what that meant was that women could no longer be fired for getting pregnant. And also back then, you could be held off of the promotional list or succession planning during your childbearing years, which for women is what, 25 years or so. So it wasn't until 1979 that women actually had the ability to go where their, you know, their abilities, their talents would take them. Uh, but at least that's what we thought. We could move ahead just based on, you know, our capabilities and so forth. But it hasn't really worked out that way. Uh, but again, this is just remember Pregnancy Act 1979. Here we are more than four decades later. And women hold only 6.6% or uh, 33 positions. And that was as of June um, of the CEO positions at Fortune 500 companies. And only 11% are top earners. So think about this 40 years yet or 41 years, and here we are um, at 11% as top earners, and that's down 14% from, from 2017. So in some ways, we're moving in the wrong direction. Then, to make matters worse, or for me, the math just doesn't add up, since 1982, women have earned more bachelor degrees than men. And since 2005, women have earned more master's and doctorate degrees than men. Yet, we're still lagging behind when it comes to getting to the top positions, or it's taking a very long time. And in fact, if we're to stay on this current trajectory that we're on, it will take women 400 years just to attain 50% of those CEO positions. And this is also borne out by other research that just the simple math will tell you if we stay exactly as we are, that's how slow it will be for us to make the, the inroads. So something's terribly wrong with this equation. You know, that's just not acceptable. So we did some research, which I'm going to share with you, um, that actually opened our eyes as to what is really going on. And it's not what most people think. So first, and my quiz is a little bit, uh, I have a true or false quiz. And while I realize that I cannot hear you, uh, but I'll just give it pause and then give the answer. So we'll start out just to see if we're on the same page or not, because I wanna test your assumptions on the glass ceiling. We all have assumptions of what's going on and what are the key problems. So what I want you to think about, is this a key reason why the glass ceiling exists today? Number one, women are just not as ambitious or driven as men. Would you say that's true or false? Just think about it in your head. And actually, uh, the answer is false. Women are every bit as ambitious as men driven to achieve, to set goals, to win, and so forth. So that's not an issue for women. Number two, men in leadership generally perform better than women in leadership. Do you think that's true or false? Okay, that's actually false as well. Men do not perform uh, better than women in leadership. And I'm going to show you some studies that are pretty eye-opening on that. Uh, number three, it's because of discrimination is the reason that women aren't making it to the very top. That's a key reason. Do you think that's true or false? I'm going to say that's false. And our data would point to our research that that's false. That's not to say it doesn't play, that it's not a factor, but it's not the key reason that women are being held back. All right, here's um, number four. Women are judged more harshly than men. Do you think that's true or false? That's actually true. And we'll, we'll share perception data with you on how women are perceived. Um, number five, men are more confident in leader roles when things are tough. 
Do you think that's true or false? That one's actually true. When the heat is on, when there's pressure, conflict, adversity, uh, men tend to use behaviors that are more aggressive and seem more confident in those situations. And the last one is women lack courage. And again, I'm going to say that the perception on that is true. And especially under pressure, adversity, and conflict, women tend to pull back versus pushing forward in most cases. And again, my answers are on the generalized data, the majority of the women in the population that we studied. There's obviously going to be outliers to that, and we'll talk about that too. Now, here's the good news. Studies for decades have shown that women and men are equally capable to serve as highly competent leaders. They both have the capabilities to serve as leaders. So women, you know, even by personality traits, intelligence, et cetera, are equally uh, well served as leaders. So you, you, after all this, when we look at the short take, and obviously I ran through this pretty quickly, so, so it just doesn't make sense when you think about it. What is really holding women back? Um, you know, we know that they're getting more degrees, they're very competent, you know, maybe some of the degrees, you know, might be in different fields, uh, but, but generally, you know, uh, women in great numbers are in organizations serving in mid-level leadership roles. Why aren't they moving to the top? Now, some false assumptions, and now, of course, Jack uh, Welsh is deceased, but he was obviously in his day a, a, an excellent, you know, top executive. And year, a few years back, he served on a panel of executive women to try to figure out what was going on with the glass ceiling and how could they help women to uh, be more promotable to the C-suite, to the top positions. And uh, this was hosted by the Wall Street Journal. And what Jack said was, women just need to over-deliver. Deliver. A performance is this. They need to push harder, rise to the top. Now, a lot of the women at that session balked and said, women are performing and trying really hard, but they're still not being, you know, viewed as, uh, as the top candidates. And, and I would have to agree with those women. I think Jack was wrong on this. I mean, he did many great things, but I think he missed the mark on this. It's not about just digging in and working harder because many of the women are doing that and they're still getting bypassed. Now here's some other what I call false or mis, you know, assumptions too that we need to be careful of. Um, and this comes from the Feminist Majority um, Foundation. And you know, if we just lean on that it's good old boy barriers keeping us out, keeping women out, or sex discrimination, sexual harassment, or lack of discrimination laws being enforced, um, that's not gonna help us move forward. Do those things exist? Absolutely. Do we need to stamp them out immediately when they're showing up? Yes, we do. But what I want to tell you today is uh, if we just focus on these things, we are not going to get ahead. OK, we do need to, again, take care of them, make sure that there isn't you know, discrimination or unlawful practices and so forth. But for our younger women, aspiring women, if we focus solely on that or if we focus, there's been a lot of studies even on microaggressions. And if we're studying, if we're focusing on some of those things, we might become too cynical. It may be non-productive. Let me just give you one quick example. Uh, McKinsey did a study, and one of the examples of a, a narrative of a microaggression was a young lady. Uh, I believe she was a um, maybe a young Hispanic lady, but she thought that uh, she she was suffering from microaggressions because everyone thought she was younger than she really was. Now, for me, um, I think if you're worried about that kind of thing or if you're getting caught up in your head because somebody might perceive you as younger, there could be a myriad of reasons that happens. Maybe you look young. Maybe you're quiet. Maybe they don't know you very well. But if we're going to focus on that, that's some kind of an act of discrimination or harassment, um, then I think we're, we're actually going inside our heads too much and we're not maybe being as productive and positive as we can. OK, so that was just a quick example, but I was really troubled that that was perceived as a microaggression. Personally, I don't see it that way. Obviously, I don't have all the data, but I just want you to think about that. We, we don't need to be so defensive and thin skinned all the time. That's not going to help us as we move forward. Um, some common advice, which is helpful, but it hasn't made the inroads in the glass ceiling, as we can tell, is yes, you need to find a mentor and coach. Obviously, I've been doing executive coaching for 21 years. I am all for coaching and, and mentoring. 
build your networks, keep them moving, uh, go to leadership training. But I would say be careful what training. As we get to the end of this, I'll, I'll explain why. Learn negotiating skills, skills that maybe you need to beef up on, work on those. Perhaps, perhaps get an advanced degree in a field that suits you, that, that really uh, aligns with your strengths. Im implementing diversity initiatives is really important. Unfortunately, as you'll see in my book, if you, if you purchase my book, uh, they're not working. They're not taking hold. You know, I think it's about eight or nine mil billion dollars have been spent on diversity, diversity initiatives, but we're not seeing the return yet. So we need to keep doing these things, but we need to do them obviously in the, in the right ways. So these are helpful. But unfortunately, it's not ending the glass ceiling, not anytime soon. So one other thing I like to touch on are men's perceptions, too. I do think in my practice and working with executives across the globe, men are keenly interested in helping women succeed. I don't think there's this concerted uh, effort to keep women out. I think it's awkward for them because they're not women, so they don't always quite understand what's going on. And a lot of people don't. We we found this data. We were doing research on another subject, and we found this this uh, difference that I'm going to share with you. But I think um, the other thing we need to be cognizant of today, since the Me Too movement and even the Kavanaugh hearings of 2018, um, men now are a little more nervous to help mentor and help women along along their way. And the Lean In organization actually uh, did some research that said um, that male managers uh, being uncomfortable mentoring women has tripled the number of men who are now uncomfortable. And I know uh, younger, even millennial uh, leaders, high level leaders who won't even meet with a woman unless they're in an open area or in a, um, you know, but not in an office one-on-one, -on -one, which I think is really a shame because we're losing opportunities. So part of what we need to do as part of the solution when I get to solutions is starting to build the trust again. We can't be living in these different worlds and women get the experiences and the mentoring and the, and the uh, you know, ride-alongs and so forth in the business that they need to, to, um, to really grow. So this is something we as women, you know, need to be aware of and we want to help our, you know, male mentors and others to not be afraid of us that we can build build good relationships. Now, so I mentioned uh, the performance of women. How do women really perform when they're given these opportunities? And in my book, I cite many studies, and here's just a couple. Um, and this was a big one, though, from the Peterson uh, Institute for International Economics. Uh, and this was a study they did a couple of years back of 22,000 companies across 91 countries. And what they found was those companies that had at least 30% women in senior leadership positions reported a 15% increase in profitability. So it's, and this is huge to see those numbers. And as I said, there's a lot of other studies, not, not as large as this, but, but show these types of results. The more women, the greater the profitability, the greater the performance. And uh, Zenger Falkman uh, did a, a, looked at the 360 data uh, of over 7,000 leaders at all levels. And what they found was that women rated higher in um, 12 of 16 competencies. And that's from their, obviously, their, their senior managers, their peers, and their direct reports. So that's so critical. Women actually uh, perform better in 12 of 16. And then on boards, there's also a lot of data out there on when women are on boards and we're trying to increase uh, board membership and so forth. When there's more women on boards, they outperform the male-dominated boards by uh, 60, uh, $655 billion, and that's according to Grant Thornton. So, and again, I probably have four or five more studies in the book, but this just gives you an example of the more women at senior positions, the better the companies will perform. So I think the other thing is, as we talk to our senior leaders in our C-suite, the case just needs to be made. Do you want to be more profitable? Do we want to perform better? We must have more women, but they have to be the right women. We've got to be careful about that. We don't want to just put women in because they're women. We have to make sure they're the best fit, and same with men, not because they're men should they get a promotion, but they need to be the right fit, and that's part of what, what we do and what we look at. So um, in our business, and uh, we started our business in 1998, we have what we call a 3D suite assessment. So we measure personality characteristics in depth. We go very deep on this uh, seven 
primary scales, 42 subscales. And this tells us a person's strengths, uh, their gifts, their talents to a nuanced level, to a very deep level. And often uh, what we find too is people have a lot of hidden talents they don't even know they have. And women's strengths on the character are, um, are overlooked routinely when it comes to succession planning because most companies don't use tools like this. They just use the typical, you know, reviewing the leaders and those processes that tend to be subjective. So this is an objective measure. So it's, it's a lot different. So we can see talent differently than these uh, pieces of perceptions that are coming through to succession planning teams. So again, then the risk factors is also uh, personality based. And that's what we're going to focus on, to, you know, in this. This is where we found the differences. And risk factors are ineffective coping strategies or the way we react under stress. And often it has nothing to do with our strengths. It might be a very different trait or behavior but it's how we cope. And I'll introduce those to you quickly, but I'll go into what we found. And last is our drivers and rewards, which is measuring one's intrinsic motivators. What is their passion? What energizes them versus what depletes them? So that's our tools. We were actually, oh, and this is, I just want to show you, um, this is uh, an average of men and women on our leadership character assessment on the primary scales. And what you can see here, just take, Again, what APA has found, others have found for years. On leadership energy, which is the first hurdle to be an effective leader, both men and women are equally, you know, they score almost on par with each other. And the other scores are all fine. Women do tend to be better at relationships, which is interpersonal sensitivity. Men tend to be slightly more strategic. Um, and, you know, studies bear that out. But the bottom line is, there's no reason not to be promoting women to the C-suite when you see this type of data. There's no reason. So, but what we found, we were actually doing some research studying 360 data and our results, and we were doing a number of demographic sorts, and one was gender. And what we found was a significant difference in the risk factors uh, between men and women leaders. So that's what led to all the rest of the research in this book. Then we studied the risk profiles of executive women and CEO women. And last, we looked at perceptions. So our risks, as I mentioned, we measure derailers or ineffective coping strategies. So when the heat is on, when there's pressure, stress, adversity, or you're not feeling good, then your risks can tend to show up. Because they're ingrained behaviors, we don't even know we're resorting to them most of the time. They're just part of who we are, right? And, um, and even thinking of these COVID times, I think of the different stressors of that, we're probably, a lot of our risks are probably showing up day to day with these different environment, the pressures, and certainly with all the uncertainty out there. And then here's the problem with risks. Um, again, when people don't realize they're doing them, they're just running amok in organizations. They're everywhere. And they lead to ineffective behaviors or even inappropriate behaviors, certainly unhelpful behaviors, okay, when it comes to performing, communicating, building relationships, maintaining relationships, and performance success. Um, everybody has them. Everybody here today, we all have our set of risks. They're based on normal personality. They're developed from the time we're infants on up. Again, I already talked about, oh, and the one thing that's kind of humorous when you hire people, then after you hire them and then their risks start showing, you think, who is this person? That's not, you know, after the honeymoon's over. Um, but that's the risk. We measure 11 of them. We're going to focus on four. False advocate, real quickly, is like passive aggressive type behavior, covert disagreement. There's a worrier, fear of failure, uh, hand wringer, cynic, uh, negativity, uh, mistrustful, pessimistic, rule breaker, prankish, uh, may go against the grain, impulsive, perfectionists are very detailed, controlling, they want it their way. Egotist, the narcissistic leader, we see it everywhere. We see it in politics, it is loud and clear in front of us daily. Uh, pleaser, these are people who seek approval, especially from their boss. They can tend to be a little bit like sycophants with their leaders. Women, if they have this, often get bypassed because it's, you know, uh, hyper moody. These are people up and down emotional swings or, or get very emotional, hot buttons, anger, uh, emotional outbursts. Detached are people who go quiet and avoid conflict. They shut down when the heat is on. Upstagers push their point of view, they're histrionic, melodramatic, and yet, you know, a lot of salespeople, a lot of leaders have this. And then eccentric is the last one. And these are just people who march to their own beat and maybe um, 
get off track and, and don't always follow uh, busy brains. They're very busy brains. So what we found in our research was that women had a statistically significant difference as worriers. So when the heat is on, they worry. Meanwhile, the male counterparts vying for the same positions are rule breakers, egotists, and upstagers, okay? So what th this is a very big deal. Think about it this way. How often is there stress and pressure, adversity in organizational life, in business or, or other organizations, in leadership and high leadership posts? The pressure is constant. So what's happening is when the pressure is on or somebody feels like their bu buttons are being pushed, and women in particular, what women are doing is they go inside their head, they worry, they want to make sure they have it 100% right, so they overanalyze, they freeze in fear. So it's a fear of failure to fear of making a mistake. So it pulls them away. It's a moving away behavior. So if we're sitting at a conference table and Joe is pushing my buttons and I'm a worrier, I will tend to shut down and go inside my head and think about it because I want to be 100% right. Well, what happens is while I'm doing that, the men at the table who are rule breakers, egotists, and upstagers, they're stealing the show. They're in the limelight. They're fighting for, even if they're not being honest or forthright about what they're talking about, they're pushing their points of view, they're being heard, and like it or not, that's viewed as leader-like. Albeit some of those behaviors are not appropriate at times, but they're still viewed as, well, he's courageous, he's got it. Meanwhile, the woman's not, nobody's even paying attention to her because she's too busy inside her head. So this is really remarkable though, because those dynamics then transcend into those succession planning teams and people making promotions. If Sarah has been quiet, even though she may be a star, a rock star getting the work done, she won't be viewed as senior leadership material. But there is good news. Let me show you the chart real quick though. So this is the difference um, that we did in our first study that we saw. And again, you can see the worrier is the second um, tick mark where the, the women are in blue and the men are in red. The men were low and the women were very high. And you can see the men spiked in rule breaker, egotist, and upstager, which are aggressive moving against behaviors. The women have moving away behaviors. So they're moving away, which it means they're pulling themselves out of the running. Nobody's doing it to them. The good news is, here's the thing, but with development, with focus on this, women can turn this around. They can turn their behaviors around. They will always be a worrier, but you don't have to let it. You can learn other tactics, other approaches, and anticipate. Joe's going to push my buttons, but I'm not going to let that happen. I have a plan, and this is what I'm going to do. And you practice, and you practice, do some role playing, and you can improve. You can increase your batting average. But the key is, if you don't even know you're a worrier and that's holding you back, you can't really improve it very well. But if you identify it, then you can work with it. You can, you know, and there's ways, and in the book we have a lot of different approaches you can take. You can work with a coach, you can go to training and learn that in those moments that you usually freeze, you've got to use a different behavior, but you've got, you've got to work on that. So, but then the question in my mind, I'm checking the time, was that, but executive women don't, that I've coached, I'm not seeing them. Most of those aren't worriers, so maybe there's something wrong with this. Why, why is it that a lot of the women I'm coaching at the high levels uh, don't seem to be worriers? So we looked at that, too, and this is just a short snapshot. We studied CEO women, and then we also studied corporate executive women, and we looked at the numbers, and what we found there was the CEO women's profiles on the risks were identical to the men's. So the women that are out there running these companies tend to be egotists, upstagers, and rule breakers in terms of their risks. The, the corporate executive women were not all of those, but they were upstagers. So they could stay in the game and like fight for resources and talk. They didn't go silent under stress. They would push hard. Um, the corporate executive women were also really good at uh, relationship building too on their, on their markedly high on their character assessment. But so, so here's the thing, the women that are making it to the top, they're naturally more aggressive under stress. The women that are, held, or that are being held back or holding themselves back tend to pull back. So that's where the development is needed. We need custom development, training, coaching, workshops to help women not shut down in fear of failure, fear of making a mistake, okay? 
We also looked at Western Europe last year. We finished a study. I'm sorry, this slide uh, when it's converted. Uh, but what we found there, I'll just point out real quickly in essence of time, the women in the study group, which was a larger group, 145 women across Western Europe, and we were working with Instituto de Prezio in Madrid, Spain, 75% of those women had high worrier. You can see that purple. So they, they were even greater worriers, if you will, higher scores. Uh, than the North American women. So I just thought that was uh, that was pretty interesting. And the rest kind of followed. Um, so real quickly, I'm just gonna, perceptions also matter. We do a lot more work and we even look at Pew Research and the perceptions. And of course, you know, what you think you see is not always what you get. That's with, with the Brad Pitt picture, of course, love Brad Pitt, so I need to put that in there. Um, but even when it comes to the risks, if a woman and a man share the same risk, the bias out there will treat the woman differently or there'll be different verbiage around that. And I'll just jump to rule breaker. If a woman's a rule breaker, she's kind of inconsistent, unpredictable, but the guy is a change agent. You know, so we, we use these, these terms and uh, egotist, well, she's kind of a bitch, but he's overconfident. He's just confident, he's courageous. So we can see uh, the woman as an upstager is too opinionated, she's too pushy, he sells his views. But again, uh, there's other, other biases that we look at, so this obviously enters into on how we're seen and how we're viewed. Um, so the key is with all of this, women have the power, but we need support systems that are essential and ecosystems such as, you know, for women that are taking time off for pregnancies and childcare, there's a lot there and I know there's a lot of new research we only have 30 minutes today, so we can't go into all that, but there's two things I think. We have a group of people that can, that can champion the solutions. The women in red, I mean, we have to take charge. If I'm a warrior or I'm a, whatever my risks are, I've gotta make sure I can overcome those so they don't hold me back, as well as making sure my strengths are shining. And then we need to get the C-suites on board, the succession planning people, et cetera. Now, so what are the solutions? You do really need to use scientifically validated assessments in your succession, in your development. It's so important because that's the only way to objectively measure talent. I mean, because all the others, even though we may ha might have very good processes and checks and balances, we're still dealing with people and their natural biases. It doesn't mean they have bad intentions. It means we're human beings and we can't see things. And as I said, there's so many talented women that get overlooked. So it's still, until we start using measures, obviously my company has those measures, there's others out there. Um, provide custom leadership and talent development and coaching. We shouldn't be trained the same as men. If, if We should all be trained as individuals. Coached what I call macro to micro. None of this generic cookie cutter stuff. It doesn't work, it slides off, it's like Teflon. We have to revise succession planning. We need to share this research. Uh, the book is in Kindle, you know, on Amazon and paperback. All the research is in there and even like worksheets. Uh, but there's no need. What I want to do too is diffuse blame game and finger pointing and all this because it's not helping women. It's not helping us. And then it's making, you know, men and others uh, be more fearful or defensive and that's not going to help us. We must get the C-suite and board of directors on board with this. We, women can't do this alone. We also need help for organizations to change their support systems, ecosystems. Last, I wanted to just share with you, and I know we're running uh, low on time. There's things that you can do to look at your own risks. Um, and, and, and if you get a copy of the book, or I can always provide a chapter on this that goes into it a little bit more, um, you need to understand what are your risk factors. Of the 11, what are your key risks? And then when you look at those risks, you're gonna ask yourself, when, what caused your risk to show, or each one of your risks? Maybe you're a worrier and a, and a perfectionist or whatever. When was the last time that showed up or last couple of times? And what was the trigger? What was, who pushed your buttons or what made you go there? Then what was the result? What happened? Uh, you know, did you uh, not speak up? Did you lose money on the deal? Did you not get the promotion? Whatever, what was the consequence? And then what was the impact? What was the impact on you, on the organization, on the team? And then the, where the real money is for you is what can you do differently? You need to brainstorm. How, what can I do instead of freezing in fear? What are some actionable steps that I can take to start to change those behaviors so that I am and, and practice it? You can't just say this in your head. I'm going to do something different and expect it to happen. 
these are ingrained behaviors and reactions. You must practice with somebody you trust that you feel comfortable with. Okay, and, I, and there's a form. You can actually make a little matrix. This is what it looks like. So here was an example. My risk factor is a worrier. Uh, what caused it to show up? I was afraid I wasn't 100% right on my answer and I didn't want to look foolish. Uh, so I failed to speak up even though I thought I had the right answer. And the team, the consequence, the team made the wrong decision. So and then it goes into what can I do differently? But again, just to give you an idea, you can start to take apart your risks and figure out better tactics for you to use so that you don't, don't uh, lose those opportunities that are so important to shine when you have all these gifts and strengths. So my call to action is know your risks, build a plan to develop tactics to neutralize your risks from harming your career or your upward tra trajectory, align with a coach to make sure you're on track and achieve your goals. So you do have the power. We all have the power. We just need to be keenly self-aware, unlike we have been in the past. It's so important to driving our careers in the best direction so that we're in a job that we love, we're really good at, we love, and that our risks are very minimal. They're not getting in our way. So that's it. And that's my book. It's available on Amazon. I would be uh, delighted if you would like to link with me on LinkedIn. I do posts and articles, uh, obviously, from time to time and different presentations. But I'm ready for questions if there are any at this point. All right. Thanks, Nancy. That was great. I'll remind everyone, if you have a question, you can use the chat box. Or you can also email info at SavvyLadies.org. And the first question that we have for you is asking if you can ultimately change your risk factors so that they're not risk factors anymore. Is that possible? No. <laughs> Unfortunately, because they're ingrained behaviors, think about it this way. If you're an extrovert as part of your personality, you can't change that to become an introvert. Uh, short of a mind-altering accident or illness, because this is hardwired by the time we're working adult age. Same as our risk. So if we, if I'm an upstager or, or something, I'm not going to be able to just wish it away. We can't wish it or train it away, but we can neutralize it. We can prevent it from interfering with our success. We can manage it more productively. So there is, there is hope, but you'll always, but it may, um, it may creep up from time to time. Time. But what you want to do is make sure it doesn't impact the important times, right? You don't want it to hurt you when it's really important. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Good. The next, the next question is asking for your thoughts on women leaders, CEO women, or executive women that are holding other women back. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm sure that that does happen. Um, you know, and... <laughs> Again, because we're not handling promotions and advancement in the proper way, the data that's being used today, and even since when we started our company, is just too subjective. So when, you, when you're letting personalities and just uh, snapshots of a person's performance or interactions dictate um, certain decisions, it does hold people back. Or sometimes if someone doesn't get along, oh, well, here's the other thing. You know, what we work on is having diverse profiles on an executive team or a C-suite team. But the funny thing is diverse profiles, that people that are really different, often don't get along very well. But they really are best in performance when you can get them together and help them leverage those differences. But that female leader may not like you because you're different. Maybe you're, you, you know, you speak out more or you, or you push the envelope with innovation. So that's where the measures can help. But women can be tough on other women. I, I don't, I, I think more and more women are trying to help. So I'm part of a lot of different forums that I go to, you know, women in energy, women in technology, women in finance. So I feel like women chambers of commerce. Uh, and we're part, we've been a women owned certified business since 2000. So I think women are now coming together better to help women. And I'm, and I'm tickled about that. I think that's so important. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you. Another question is, Asking about the, the Me Too movement and some of the negative repercussions that you mentioned. Yes. Um, and just asking what if you have some ideas on how we can work to fix that. Yeah, I mean, obviously, um, I think there's going to take work on both sides. I think, you know, if we start, and I, I know it sounds funny, but if we start to use objective measures and we get better people in jobs all the way around as we promote, better teams, 
where we're not allowing bad behaviors to run amok, okay, um, women aren't going to feel as intimidated by some of those, you know, over aggressive behaviors because women will have more power too. But it's, but it is a matter of building trust. I think that we as women and young women, especially, and I have two daughters and two daughter-in-laws that are, you know, young in their working careers is we can't wear our feelings on our sleeves. We can't be hunting for every, uh, you know, microaggression or that somebody might be trying to hurt our feelings. We do have to get a little tougher at times, like put your game face on. Don't look for things that might be, you know, there's enough going out on without looking for things that somebody might think something wrong. Does that make sense? That's part of that worrier and, and women tend to overanalyze every, every little cue that's out there. So it's a matter of relaxing and not trying to overanalyze, I think. And then working with men to be, you know, to show them that we trust them. We ha it has to be a two-way street. But I think if we start using objective measures, the other piece that I didn't really get to, we also have to hold people accountable for their risk behaviors. Just because we have risks, that's not an excuse for bad behaviors. So while we're doing the things with women we need to do, when let's say aggressive behaviors are over the top inappropriate or even harassing or bullying, we need to stop it and hold them accountable and not let them have those positions if they're gonna continue on those paths. So, so there's a lot of work to, you know, in 30 minutes, I can't, I can't get into all of it, but, but I think the idea of asking for help as a woman, going to people, people, it's hard for somebody to not help you if you ask for help or if you ask for feedback, because generally we're hardwired to help each other. So do those things, be willing to take those, I think, be willing to, uh, to ask and take it on, don't, don't start to cry, you know, so don't get yourself too defensive. Accept feedback, welcome feedback, I think would be really helpful for women, okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, and the last question, you, you kind of touched on this in your answer there, but I'll just ask this last question is, if character qualities that actually make women good leaders are considered weak, what's one thing we can do about that now? Well, I would have to talk about to the individual, you know, it's all individually based. So often if you have a short, and we all have short sides, we're not good at everything. Number one, even if you have a set of leadership competencies on the wall, nobody's good at all of those. And even though people are told they are, they aren't. So find out those things you are good at. And if there's a gap that you have, that's something that's find a job that better suits you. What I'm saying is, yeah, you, if you have a, let's say your leadership energy scores maybe in the mid range, well, you have a good pulse. You can develop more as a leader. But if you don't have, if you're like 10 on leadership energy, pursue a professional. Don't go into a leadership role because you're going to struggle. So you want to, what I want you to do is really try to harness your strengths and work on developing those so you don't have to constantly work on a gap. But obviously, there's ways you can build skills. If you have a, uh, just one gap and you're good at everything else in your job, you know, you, you need to work on that. And there's ways you can shore it up uh, or come up with apps or things to support you. I mean, so there's things you can do if it's just one area. But make sure you want to look for jobs that you're really well suited to and, then you'll, and that you love, that you feel, you know, that you're getting uh, a lot of excitement and passion out of doing that work. So, uh those two things, know your strengths and what drives you, what you enjoy, and then you'll always have a happy, productive career. Mm -hmm. And that minimizes okay. your risks. One last thing, if you're happy and you're mm -hmm. working to your drivers, your risks don't show because you can't be. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's, that's another great way to manage your risks is to be happy. Yeah. <laughs> okay, great advice. I love that. Okay. Um, all right, so those are the questions that we have for you. So I want to thank you again, Nancy, for a really, really excellent presentation, so much interesting information that you shared with us today. I want to thank everyone for joining us today and asking questions. We will be sending contact information that's on this slide here and how you can get the book as well. And thank you so much, Nancy. It was really great. Okay, thank you. You take care now. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.